Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think Vincent is a much better speaker, so I got to speak first. Um, so welcome to Shanghai. Uh, maybe a little bit self introduction first. Um, I'm originally from China. I grew up in a city called Wuhan, and then I studied in Peking, uh, in Be Beijing, in Peking University for finance. So I actually switched my uh, my career from finance to healthcare, and then got my PhD in the U.S. Uh, so I also lived in the U.S. for a few years uh, as a health. Uh, so my profession is actually a health economist. Uh, before to Nexus House, I was teaching at Duke and the National University of Singapore in a medical school. Uh, so I think I try to uh, incorporate some of the whole ASEAN, like Asia Pacific um, perspective into this pre presentation as well, because I always sort of compare what's happening in China to uh, the regional perspective. I think coming from Europe, this may also be helpful. Um, so a little bit. Uh, introduction about uh, our organization, Access House. So we are a nonprofit think tank advisory group, headquartered in the U.S. and operates in eight countries globally. Now, we actually we have a small office in the Netherlands, and Amsterdam is one of my favorite cities. So uh, again, welcome. Look forward to visit uh, Amsterdam in the near future again. Uh, and we, so I'm personally responsible for Greater China and Singapore for Access House. Um, so our vision is everyone, no matter where they live. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know. Uh, no matter what their age, have a right to access to high quality and affordable healthcare. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, we, we, we are focusing on healthcare assistance research. Uh, I think I would say half of our work is advising governments. So, from that perspective, we really learn and work very closely uh, in setting policy directions uh, for the countries that we work on. And then in the other half, we actually working very closely with the industry. Uh, but this is again from a healthcare system perspective. So understanding what government and the healthcare system objective is, and we're sort of consulting for corporates and startups to develop their business that can fit into the future healthcare reform objectives. Uh, and then in the, also we do a lot of global exchange, uh, sort of bring international partners to Asia and to and vice versa. Um, okay, so I have two pictures uh, in my first slide. I don't know uh, the connection. Yeah. Uh, is it a con I think it's the. It's just a beamer. Pro I think the projector might have. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Vincent just show me this fancy uh, function. This, so I don't know how many of you uh, have watched, have heard of the movie on the left. It's called Dying to Survive. Uh, if you haven't, I suggest you uh, to to search for it. It's a very very interesting story. Anyone of you heard of this? Okay, good. Uh, it's actually one of the biggest blockbuster in China last year, and actually made a huge societal impact. It's based on a real story. Uh, in China, that many patients actually forming groups to to sort of illegally smuggle drug from India uh, to other patients with the same conditions, and then some of them were put into jail, and then that's really initiating the national discussion in how to covering uh, med medicines for people. So it actually was one of the large, uh, the biggest uh, societal impact movie of in China, in China last year, and then this also called directly the Prime Minister of China. Uh, and then the president to call for addressing access to cancer treatments uh, in China. And this is a, the other uh, very, very important news uh, last year actually was like highly become the number one discussed topic in, in, for a few months last year. Uh, it's a major scandal on vaccine. So I think from these two major events happening in the last year, you can see out of the triangle, the three um, main components of healthcare system, quality, access, and uh, the China healthcare system currently have major gaps, both in access to healthcare and also in the quality of healthcare. <clears throat> and in today's talk, I just want to focus on uh, a few components. Basically, I will describe the, a little bit of history uh, in what's happening in the healthcare system in China in the last few years, uh, some major um, features, uh, the rapid aging, a stressed healthcare system, and major funding gaps. And then also, I want to share with you some of 
our uh, perspectives, uh, we studied uh, the major trends that are happening in the market right now. Uh, I think a lot of that trends is actually relevant to the tool that uh, Dorit and uh, Coinset Group did, uh, designed for you. And then maybe there are some similarities between China and European markets uh, in that sense as well. Um, by the way, if there's any uh, immediate question, feel free to interrupt me, uh, or we, I think we have some time in the end uh, for Q&A as well. First on the healthcare system. Um, so I think the aging population, I don't need to describe further, but um, this is the trend we see in Asia. Uh, so China is the blue line here, and then there are some other major markets uh, in Asia. Uh, you see it's very, very rapid aging. So basically what took Europe and the US 100 years to achieve the aging process is uh, happening in Asia in a few decades, maybe 20 years, 30 years. So it's both aging very rapidly, but also um, really the healthcare system and then the system to providing care to the aging population need to also address addressing the challenge very even more fa fast uh, to uh, to accommodate uh, the the speed of the aging population in this in this place. So this is a study we did in Singapore, but I think it shares similar story in China, especially due to the uh, single child policy. Uh, so we can see the number and the portion of disabled elderly are also rising. So it's not just uh, the, the absolute number of elderly, but also more and more elderly, uh, because they're more aged, they're living with some ADL uh, limitations. And then in the meantime, in Asia, family size are getting much smaller. This means uh, informal care, be able to support uh, the aging population is also diminishing. And then this is very interesting. We found that in Singapore, more uh, caregivers have significant depression due to, uh, due to uh, care, caregiving. So really the aging challenges is not just caring for the people who are old already or who are rapidly aging, but also the entire family and the society is having major, major impact because of this uh, rapid process. The second one is uh, the stressed healthcare system. So this is a picture, a real picture took at 6 a.m. in a public hospital in China. It's very different than in Europe, I bet. Um, actually, um, I think, I don't know how many of you have been to China before. Can you raise hand? Okay, many of you. <laughs> so you might have some sort of uh, snapshots in the healthcare system. Uh, but we are, I think our achievement, and Vincent was just sharing me some major um, quality, uh, health system quality standards in the US uh, is not, um, it's sort of compa uh, it's comparable to the US. Uh, so there, we definitely made some good achievements uh, in China uh, before 1980s. Uh, and there, uh, you can see uh, uh, we have a very uh, interesting and well-designed uh, primary care system um, run by the barefoot doctor. And then, uh, so it's a very low cost, uh, but um, sort of ra very rapidly be able to boost uh, the infant mortality rate, uh, uh, reduction of infant mortality rate and life expectancy for the whole healthcare system. Well, after 1980s, uh, also in, along with the uh, open door policy. So at the time, basically government decided to let the healthcare system um, go more sort of free market and then letting the public hospitals to make their own money. So it creates a very interesting uh, development in the last, I would say, um, for even now. So I think one of the, the main critique in the current system is that the hospitals, even public hospitals, they are not acting as a non-profit organization because maybe only 20% of their revenue is from the government directly. So the majority of the revenue they still need to make, make uh, from their providing care. And then, so as a doctor, they also are setting up incentives for themselves to make money, as much money as possible instead of getting paid on salary and then uh, just providing care to people. So this is a very interesting and a very unfortunate development uh, over that maybe 20, 30 years. And then I think since the new healthcare reform, which happened 10 years ago, everything pushing the government side is trying to address this problem. Um, so this is a, a figure uh, we used, uh, but it's a snapshot of a few 
a, a few decades uh, in the healthcare systems uh, on health, healthcare expenditure. So you can see the purple line, uh, sorry, the pink line here is the out-of-pocket expenditure. Uh, the yellow line is the social health insurance. And then the red uh, is the government health expenditure. We see a very drastic uh, decrease actually since uh, 1984 uh, in government expenditure and then only pick up here. So this is the SARS, the major flu influenza uh, epidemic that happened across whole Asia that really starting making the government realizing it's a major, major problem, the, the healthcare system that they, they need to address. And then since then, I think there's some rebalancing uh, in the healthcare uh, systems. So we call this period from 2001 to 2010, 2009 is the first phase of the new healthcare reform. But we are now in the second phase of healthcare reform. So we just passed the 10 years, which is 2009 to 2019. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about these three mm -hmm. uh, financial public uh, health and government? Who is paying for these uh, expenses? Yeah, okay. So I think, uh, so usually government health expenditure is basically tax money, right? So it's directly from the finance, uh, governmental finance. So this may be government investing in public health, building new hospitals in infrastructure, and then also sometimes providing subsidies to pay to people. And then social. Uh, yeah, it's government health expenditure. So basically the paying by the government directly. Uh, it can be both national or, or, or state or local governments. Yeah. But this basically from the tax finance, and then the social health insurance is the, the pooling of the uh, the national health health insurance. So people paying uh, from their uh, the, their contribution to the uh, universal insurance coverage. Now in China, but we achieved a almost <coughs> universal health insurance coverage, uh, but the coverage uh, amount is low, uh, and the out pocket is is the others uh, like private insurance and out of pocket uh, payout. Was it one of the targets to, to reduce out-of-pocket expenses? Yes. Um, it was quite a decrease. Yes. So, but uh, yeah. So I think that's actually one of the the more positive aspect here. Uh, but I think the other uh, the other challenge now is also uh, how to balancing uh, the sustainability of the of the system. And then I think it recently I have figure update later. Uh, it's actually picking up a little bit more the, the fraction of our pocket payments, and then in the meantime, the healthcare expenditure is increasing uh, dramatically. So the dominator is growing bigger as well. But anyways, so this first phase healthcare reform, as just based on looking at the numbers, I think it's on a positive direction. Right, government is spending a little bit more, and the social insurance is having better coverage, and then uh, de declining uh, our pocket payments. So this is basically uh, the key objectives for the healthcare reform. Um, basically, uh, speed up the uh, establishment of universal housing insurance system. Uh, so now I think it's about 98% uh, or something uh, uh, in, in China. So almost every Chinese citizen has a, a universal housing insurance. Um, but uh, again, the payment, uh, so the coverage was mostly uh, paying for hospital care and uh, it's not, uh, and then the, the level of coverage is not deep. And then I think. Who pays for the insurance? Insurance is risk this pooling, right? So money, everyone contributing to the insurance. From the, state. the consumers are paying or the employer? Uh, yeah, so it's a mixed contribution. Um, and then in, for, so, so in China, we, so the universal insurance coverage, we have, we used to have three different schemes for different uh, group of people. So we have employer, employee, uh, based scheme, and then we have a uh, uh, sort of residential scheme, and then we have a rural residential sc scheme, and they each have different uh, payment and subsidy model. So the, for instance, the rural one, the out-of-pocket payment is very little. Uh, sorry, the, the individual premium contribution is a smaller fraction, and the government paying a lot in uh, as a subsidy. Uh, well, for the employee ones, government is not covering uh, providing subsidy, but it's a mixed contribution between the employee and employers. Yeah. Okay. So the other, uh, some other uh, development uh, in that uh, in in the re uh, in the past uh, uh, two decades are like we set up a essential drug health uh, essential drug system, 
and now it's updated uh, very uh, actually since last year. Uh, it's going to have frequent updates every year. So basically, take out the not valuable drugs from the list and then adding more uh, in a more rapid way, and then uh, trying to improve primary care health network. I will touch a little bit on that uh, later. I think it's still a major challenge. And then also providing equal access to public uh, health care for urban and rural residents. I think in that aspect, uh, they did achieve quite a bit uh, in providing universal insurance coverage for the, uh, the people living in the rural area. And now also uh, one of the directions moving forward is to merge the three schemes of uh, health uh, insurance programs into one. Uh, so they're already merging the, uh, the, city, the city residents and the employee uh, program providing sim similar coverage and benefits. And then in the future, they're also emerge, merging uh, the rural ones uh, to the urban, urban plants. And then again, as I mentioned, uh, one of the major challenge, uh, uh, the pain points in the healthcare system here is the public hospital reform. So I have more pictures in the hospital. Uh, so this is uh, in a children's hospital. This is a air content. Uh, when the hospital is 100% full, they need to just build like contemporary space to hosting people. And then I don't know. I found those pictures online, but I don't know if it's real. But this is a reflection of uh, the deterioration of the relationship between <laughs> doctors and and physicians and and the patient. How many people, this was about 10,000 specialists being attacked or something like that a year, or what kind of numbers are there? Uh, I, I, I don't have the actual numbers, but it's quite frequent. We can see those news. And I think uh, this is, a, again, also another major uh, push in both letting the uh, development more sort of humanity education in the medical field, but also public recognition in healthcare as a profession. So it's unfortunate, but uh, in such a big country, we really need to spend more effort in rebuilding that uh, patient and uh, physician uh, relationship and trust. Yes? Um, I understood there's a difference in, in what you have uh, within your insurance, uh, the rural insurance and the more urban areas. Yeah. And that a lot of people from the rural areas uh, come to the bigger cities mm -hmm. to have the healthcare. Yeah, so I think if the those people who are not employed in a formal manner, so they don't have access to the employee-sponsored uh, insur uh, universal insurance uh, scheme, they have to go to back to their rural area to use their rural insurance plan. So that's one of the major challenges for immigrant uh, workers here in China. So they get less? Much less. less, less much less. But, uh, but the premium is very, very low. I think it's, um, oh. it's like a few, a few euro that they pay uh, each year. Each, each year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the individual paid. No, we, in China, the, I think in some rural area, the, uh, the total like, annual income is a few hundred euros still. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in China, I think we, have, we do have a major divide uh, still trying uh, the gap between cities and uh, rural areas. And so I think it's going to be a long way for really sort of making a holistic uh, universal insurance coverage with the same benefit to everyone. Um, but I think that's another also motive for the government to start to think about private insurance, which I will touch base upon. Because the, seat, the, the, the whole country is so divided and then so, 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 so many, many uh, diversity. Uh, so people have diversity needs. So as a government, how to launch a universal insurance program that really cover for all and cover all the basic for everyone. So that's uh, another major uh, needs. So this is the funding gap uh, in both China and in other Asian countries. I think some of the numbers need to be updated, but uh, let's get the idea. So you can see the out-of-pocket payments uh, is in general, oh, sorry, in general quite high uh, in most ASEAN, uh, Asian countries. And then uh, the, 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 the fraction of people who own private insurance is also very, very low. Uh, China is about 30%. So I think Singapore, Singapore is the highest. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. What's the figure in, in the Dutch? In Holland, I think the out of pocket is something like 20%. Okay. No. No. Actually, it's supposed to be a little factor. No, yeah, the out of pocket is more than the lay of the average cost. 15% or 18%? No, it's 5,500 euros. Yeah, but I would say, yeah, it's 350. It would need to be on factor. 
Maar dat hangt toch vanaf hoeveel post je hebt? Drie maanden op de IC ligt. Nou, oké, maar even tot in de bank. Oké, is dat. Heb je looked at it? Western versus Asia? Yeah, I think uh, also it's not just uh, comparing Western. Uh, so, so there are also different uh, in healthcare system design, right? Like the French model or the UK model. Our patient, the out-of-pocket payment is extremely low. While in the US, uh, many many circumstances still very high out-of-pocket uh, pay payment. Yeah, and if you have what's the difference between public insurance and, and private health insurance? So, for example, Ping An, who has 700 million. <laughs> Uh, health insurance clients are mm -hmm. they private or public? How do you? How would that you those are private. Yeah? Private, but they don't have uh, 300 million private insurance users. They have 300 million users in their platform, but they're not uh, in, uh, insurance beneficiaries. Yeah. Um, I would say so. Now the figure we got is about 20 percent of Chinese, but I think it's 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 a little bit exaggerated. And then most people in China now, if they have a private health insurance. It's the very, very basic kind. They just pay like a few hundred RMB per year uh, to receive a lump sum payout if they have a very major critical disease. So it's not that comprehensive reimbursement based uh, insurance, uh, private insurance product. OK, so this is another, uh, I think, very interesting figure. Uh, looking at the gap, funding gap between Asian countries and uh, low, low income, and me, low and middle income Asian countries and uh, the OECD members. You can see the funding, uh, the expenditure average per capita is slowly growing, but uh, it's not, it's, it's never going to be pick, uh, picking up uh, the, where the expenditure is in OECD. So I think, at, and another, I think, very, very uh, interesting trend now here, especially in China, uh, you can put in, so to help you put into perspective, the Chinese economy is slowing down, right? If you're a, a government, you think about, okay, we're, we need to increase our health expenditure, providing more care to people. But in the meantime, what's the economic driving force in the last uh, maybe 20, 20, 30 years, we grow really, really fast, is slowing down. So can we really provide unlimited benefits to people? So that's always the debate, right? How to be able to still contain what the government expenditure is, knowing that the, the economy is not going to pick up the same speed as the past, while trying the best to providing basic good quality care to people. So you, you never be able to, so, so, so basically everyone will assume that there will always going to be a limit in what the healthcare expenditure are. Just accept that fact while designing the system to make it more efficient. Okay, so there are some few, uh, actually those are uh, a, a screenshot of my WeChat uh, moments. Uh, it's like uh, the Facebook, uh, but those are interesting stories. So you can see this one. Um, so this is a reflection of the distorted pricing and uh, people's access. So we have free access uh, in, in the healthcare system. We don't have a gatekeeper here in China. And then, so this is uh, a, a lady took a pet to a public hospital. He said it's actually much cheaper to see the doctor here than going to the veteran. Uh -huh. So the pricing is very, very different. Uh, it's very, very uh, sort of misset, right? And this is another uh, example. So in this kind of system, while majority of, especially for for very uh, significant uh, sort of critical cancer treatment, innovative drugs, out-of-pocket payments is very, very high, or many of them are not getting your healthcare insurance. Some of the new uh, treatments uh, that recently developed are pricing over a million US. So how can I imagine anyone can afford that? So well, they're over one million dollar drug, and then uh, the just going to see a doctor in a public hospital is so mispriced. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, misaligned incentives in the system. Okay, so I think that those are some of the. Uh, major, uh, I think, pain points we, 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 we lay out uh, in the system. I think you can verify those uh, in your coming days, uh, going to your, your site visit. Uh, especially, I think, some of the public hospitals that you'll be seeing, I think, would be very interesting uh, to put this into uh, some perspective. And then, uh, okay, I would then describing uh, the three trends we see uh, towards, uh, uh, towards the healthcare system. Any more questions so far? Yeah. Yes. Um... Thank you.
my question is a lifestyle related and hopefully a prevention mm -hmm. lifestyle again. So my my first question is, uh, do you see an increase on lifestyle related diseases like uh, type two diabetes, mm -hmm. obesity, yeah. that kind of thing, which would be a third problem uh, on top of the two that sure. already. Uh, and secondly, I was told that in traditional Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. there was a lot of focus on a healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. and, and um, staying in shape. And mm -hmm. also, someone mm -hmm. told me, you paid as a customer your traditional Chinese doctor mm -hmm. for the amount of time that you stayed healthy. Mm -hmm. So it was a twisted incentive on the Western side. Mm -hmm. Is that true or is that in I think the second one, I, I don't know what's the current, uh, I, I don't think we have that payment scheme now, no, no. And then, but I think, I, I, I agree that uh, TCM in the past really focusing on lifestyle and then, uh, and then well, adjustments uh, in making a more balanced uh, sort of health, healthy uh, life and healthy body. Uh, but I think current, in the recent years, really, most people in China, they, when they have any disease, they still directly seek for uh, for uh, for Western medicine, or if it's TCM, mostly for sort of more pain relief or some TCM medicines uh, treatments. So I think that part actually, which you described, which is quite important and potentially uh, benefits beneficial, uh, it's not very widely adapted by people right now. But I think maybe now uh, it's a, another trend that the government want to boost uh, if we can apply for TCM more. Uh, in the system, uh, especially moving towards more health model than the treatment model. And then the first one, no, that's absolutely right. So I think now uh, in the last 20 years or so, the disease burden in China is really shifted from uh, communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. So I think we have one of the highest uh, rates for diabetes and also so heart failure and then uh, cardiovascular related diseases are, all those are number one, and number top five killers. Not in the, the increase on those diseases is, is that uh, portrayed in the curve that you showed us? Uh, so the I think the 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 the, the curves I showed it's more on expenditure, right? So, uh, but I, but that's I think in, it's a parallel, very important trend. Yeah, and that's also I think one of the motives for the, this healthcare system transformation, which I would be describing, because uh, as people are uh, the burden moving towards more chronic, chronic disease, uh, certainly the big hospital-centric, just acute care treatment-based mo model is no longer cost-effective. But thank you for the very nice questions. Okay. So those are some of the key words I want to highlight for the healthcare reform, uh, I think, in the, in the last 10 years and also moving forward. So I want to build a more connected and integrated model system, more people-centered higher quality and value-based, really starting formally talking about value and measuring outcomes uh, in last, maybe since, since two years ago in China. And then it's really a long way to go and then more affordable and sustainable. So this is, a, 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 a sim, I think, a very interesting model, which is Singapore, but I think in China, uh, many in, uh, frontier healthcare reform sites are sort of piloting this model and trying to learn from this model in designing the system. So in Singapore, uh, unlike China, we, we do have a gatekeeping model. So basically we have a, um, a, a tiered referral system from the community level to up to the acute hospital. But the problem in the past is after people get into the acute hospital, there's no way back. So they are, they, they had a condition, they go back to community and then they usually always revisit uh, to the acute hospital again and then making the pressure here is very very high and again similar to the disease burden as uh, the lady described uh, it's become a major stress uh, to the healthcare system so what the system now is doing is enhancing basically the primary care and the community-based services uh, both self-care and also more formal care in the uh, community and uh, in the primary uh, primary care level and then also more structurally putting transitional care and post-acute services that uh, specialized designed to helping patients moving from hospital to home uh, with a smooth uh, path. And also the service integration. So, so those are really gonna be some of the major highlights, right? Uh, uh, population health and disease prevention, 
and also the post-acute care and disease management portion. And I think in China, currently we are always talking about this piece and starting to do more of this. But as everyone knows, this actually takes longer time to see an impact, right? It's really changing behavior to prevent the first uh, uh, primary prevention. Uh, but this, I think, we, we just haven't even got the opportunity to, 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 to focus on. But I think this is very, very important. And it has been a major focus for Singapore in the last five years. I see, I think, similar challenges in the, in the Netherlands in really linking hospital to uh, medical care, to social care, I mean, uh, long-term care as such. Okay, so in terms of uh, system integration, um, I think Singapore is uh, de de developing similar to the Kaiser Permanente model, if you know. So basically, regional healthcare system. So one major healthcare system, a group that holds both uh, tertiary care and primary care and secondary care and then providing population-based care to the region. Uh, so it's fully integrated, uh, that system they're developing. While in China, we have, we call this medical consortium model. So it's not one ownership, but providing stronger linkage between the primary care systems, secondary health care, and the big hospitals. And then making those organizations working together as a team to providing uh, better uh, coordination and integration of services and then also other programs. In. So, but I think this is another major trend that's happening across Asia at different levels. But, um, but in China, in the service delivery side, this is one of the major uh, push to have uh, the medical consor consortium being formed in different regions, and also to push people to utilizing different tiers of healthcare system more in a different way. So primary care, really going to the primary care uh, providers rather than everyone just no matter what condition you have, going to uh, the big hospitals directly. And then and I think, again, as the lady said, uh, uh, the, on the higher level in terms of the vision for the healthcare system is towards a more patient-centered and a uh, health model rather than a uh, treatment-based uh, model. So we officially are starting talking about Healthy China 2030 uh, in the year of 2016. And then I think very, very similar policies that launched in many other Asian countries. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is another, another interesting part. It's this called hierarchical uh, health systems. Yeah, it's the hierarchical medical system. Um, basically to have the different level of care be more and more um, uh, clear, and then people, based on their different healthcare needs, to be able to receive care in different level of healthcare uh, providers. Maybe sometimes for some questions. <laughs> yes. The balance is quite difficult to invest in prevention because the mm. system is not related to the patient. Only invest in China because you have the program for prevention. It's not easily integrated in the regular system. I think, um, so later, I think in a digital um, health world, Many sort of uh, private companies are trying to do that, but that's only I think catering for a very small fraction of audience, right? Maybe the top five percent uh, income population in China. But on our whole system level, in the population level, I think it's still a very very long way to go. I think uh, all those, but but the thing is, the government first trying the highest level promoting this concept, and then letting the health, uh, the the goal of uh, healthcare system moving just beyond just receiving treatment, but also the health, the, the health model. So I think it's more participatory approach and then letting people see, thinking about healthcare, not just about hospitals, but many other aspects in health. So I think uh, that's on a high level, the government trying to push that concept, but in actual world in the healthcare system, adding prevention components to it, I think that's, that's we only happen in a few cities that uh, they're just starting. So the immediate goal in the system now is at least people, when they have smaller conditions, they can go to the primary care setting. 
instead of everyone rushing to the hospital. Yeah, the um, I think, um, unfortunately, I think doctors are more uh, money driven. I think, uh, you know, because that's really, as, as I mentioned, in the, I think this is a, a, a pain point uh, for China as the economic grow um, so fast in the last 30 years, right? So everyone, every profession is seeing a major divide in high income people and then be able to afford uh, like uh, the housing price, for instance. I don't know, and a few, I think a few of you have been in China. Uh, the housing price in the cities, uh, I think have uh, increased by five to 10 times in the last 10 years. So I think all those conditions, right? People are, get, many people, they start their own business and then made a fortune. And then the, in the meantime, the housing price, the whole cost of living really increasing skyrocketing. So as a doctor, if you're just getting a minimum salary, it's, and then comparing to how hard your work is, and you can see hundreds of people, patients, and then the education you received, I think every, they, they, they won't be able to, uh, they, they, they are looking at how much money they can receive anyways by the end of the year. So I think, um, and also in the last 30 years, even in the public hospitals, as I mentioned, the, the public funding, direct fun financing funding, only counts for about 20% to 30%. So the hospitals, they still need to design in able to make money that uh, to help their expansion and then to giving, paying their uh, doctors uh, in terms of allowance and uh, much higher pay uh, payment. Is there a lot of uh, under the table uh, paying? Uh, you need a doctor, you want good quality and attention, and you don't want to wait so long. Can you pay him? You know, I, I would say in the past, yeah, in the past we we say that uh, we I think that's a, sort of a common common scheme. But now nowadays I think my personal impression I think is much better. Uh, but uh, in the past I think it's not just the doctors receive patient pay money. That's the major problem. The major problem was the pharmaceutical companies. They are uh, sort of so the hospital making money by putting additional price tag into the, the drugs they sell. Yeah. So, so they are actually having incentives to, pre to prescribing more, right, to overuse. So the department can get more profit, and then in the end of the year, they can give to every doctors. So I think that's a, a major. 2005, huh? I think 2005, the 15% margin on yeah. the book of five. Is it now going down? Yeah. Now? So we formally uh, sort of forbidden that. Uh, so uh, since since I think two or three years ago. Uh, so the government is officially sort of cutting the hospital revenue by just selling uh, prescribing drugs. Okay. So again, similar uh, more similar uh, high level policies are set in other Asian countries and regions. Um, Okay, I think the second uh, the second uh, uh, point I want to mention is technology uh, innovation. I think everyone coming to China to see the digitization, right? So this is a, a picture we took actually in Singapore. So the, the many uh, Asian, uh, even elderly, they are kind, kind of like the Dutch. They're very active actually. Also the adaptation of technology, I think in Asia is quite high. Um, so there are many, many aspects in healthcare system can be digitized and can be leveraged by technology. I don't think we need to mention too much about that. And then I think this is an interesting study. Uh, this is um, uh, it's, uh, it's published by Goldman Sachs. Uh, it's saying um, really the, the major disruption in, uh, in technology in healthcare system. Uh, so in, currently a lot of the bio and life science innovation that happening are, are like this. So high cost, high tech and low access. Uh, so discover uh, innovative drugs and uh, new devices. So that actually ate up a lot of the healthcare uh, system cost, right? So just imagine how much big piece of the entire healthcare system cost going to paying for those new technologies, uh, the, the life science and uh, medical device industry. Well, in the future, potentially, the digital, digital health and digital care can be providing lower cost and high tech and high access model. So it's going to be potentially a rebalancing in the total healthcare funding towards new source of technology that are going to healthcare. 
and then uh, make, maybe even making the entire healthcare system more uh, efficient. So this is uh, many uh, digital health and health tech companies are booming in China and ASEAN. So here I make a selected a few players. You can see, but I think the interesting thing here I want to highlight is it's really ranging from the common and then players in technology and the uncommon ones. Uh, so we have the tech uh, MNCs, uh, like uh, everyone, right? Google, uh, IBM, uh, Microsoft, Intel. We have the Asian tech uh, uh, companies like Grab, DD, BAT, B, uh, everyone is doing healthcare. And then also, the, I think in the, in the West, uh, insurance co uh, companies are known to be conserv conservative, while in Asia, many newer insurance companies are really embracing digital technology, and uh, they are seeing health as a major market for them. So Ping An, uh, I think one of the very interesting ones is Zhongan Technology, and then on, even on finance. So many fintech and major insur uh, insurance platform uh, are also devoting into digital health. And then I think this is very interesting. Many telecoms and also distributors uh, in the market are having their digital health on right now. Uh, in China, and then certainly many, many startups and unicorns uh, in this market. And, and also more enablers and more collaborators, which means more business model for startups. So I think uh, this is very interesting because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the pharmaceutical company was and the hospitals, those two are the major, the strongest one in the healthcare system in China, right? So as the government is changing the way to, uh, reimburse, to reimburse hospital on prescribing, the actually the pharmaceutical companies are looking for new channels that they be able to withhold their market share, right? So they are actually quite uh, open to embracing digital technology that can directly to see or to uh, with the digital uh, companies the platform to work directly with the uh, doctors, or they want to embrace uh, private insurance. So I think because the whole healthcare system is under that major change, I think in this market. The pharmaceutical companies and medical device are extremely open and pushing actually the, those uh, uh, innovations in the digital uh, space. And then many uh, certainly technology platforms and insurance companies, this is also interesting because uh, as I mentioned, private insurance in China is just starting booming. And then so all the newcomers are starting looking to private health insurance product, they're seeing technology as their major enabler. Right, so that's also how they set themselves apart from the social health insurance. And then uh, also the service provider groups and distributors, they're also uh, sort of open in uh, working with uh, digital health, uh, companies. But I think currently the challenge is uh, the government is really just providing a high level enabling uh, environment saying, okay, you can, that all the digital technology, technology company, you can do this. We give you a lot of freedom, right? We're not have the burden like in Europe, the, the big data privacy and the data use uh, challenges. So uh, those sort of barriers we took out, but the government is not directly paying for the technology themselves. So they let the industries and other industry partners working with the, uh, developing other business model. So this potentially also be some risk, which I can highlight later. So if, if you imagine all these technologies are used by pharmaceutical companies, which will be potentially the end user, or by big hospitals to maintain their strong power, it might sort of contradict to the healthcare reform objective, which really end to rebalancing the payer and the provider and uh, the pharmaceutical companies, right? So, so now actually uh, the, the government in the central level is starting looking to how analyzing all these technologies, how they're fitting into healthcare reform objective, how they might be able to provide gaps and challenges to the healthcare reform, and then designing new reimbursement and regulatory uh, models that giving the business model to digital health companies when they be able to support healthcare reform objective. So I think that's very, very important. Chris? Yes. Um, how can, can you talk a little bit about the national government analyzing, making policy, mm -hmm. and then you have the provinces, mm -hmm. and then you have the cities, and you yeah. have all the different regions. And they all have to implement all that stuff. How is that working? Yeah. And how, how fast is that look? Mm -hmm. And do people innovate? You know, uh, do they take innovation best practices from little projects mm -hmm. and put it on national standards, or do they come up with a national idea and then push it downwards? 
Sure. Uh, so I think in China, okay, there are policies that are directly set by the national level, right? For instance, open up for uh, reimbursement for internet uh, uh, consultation, or it is can be um, uh, stop using uh, uh, adding a uh, price uh, to margin to selling drugs in the hospitals. So those directions can directly set by the governments. But I think usually in the usual case, the central level government setting high level directions while the local government pilots. So usually with the, within a major direction, there can be 10 to 100 pilots that happening across the country. And then people are saying when the pilot starting happening in Beijing, then that's going to be coming the national standard in the future. So Shanghai, for instance, is one of the more open place to do pilot and then become one of the new movers. And then the, in China, I think in the healthcare system, there are a few provinces like Hangzhou, you'll be uh, is extremely open for digitalization, right? It's always the first place to break up that reimbursement or different regulatory hurdles for digital technology. And then but the, the central government, they just watch and they just say, okay, as long as this within my framework and the high level objectives, I encourage them to see what's happened. And then after that, maybe after five years, they go back to reevaluate and then to launching more specific policy on the national level. I think this is really where we are in the digital health. So I think you're coming a very interesting year, but I think maybe since uh, from next year, there will be many, many interesting policy across different uh, uh, ministries are launching um, specifically providing guidance uh, for uh, regulating the digital health industry in China. So I just want to maybe highlight here a little bit. So again, all the policies you see here, uh, I think we can share the deck so we don't need to look into the detail, are uh, relevant to uh, basically encouraging uh, on a high level. Uh, but um, but uh, this year actually uh, is the 10th year anniversary for healthcare reform, as I mentioned. Um, so the uh, the, the Prime Minister Office in China actually directly assigned WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, to be the one coordinating all the ministries on review of the 10-year healthcare reform. Because why? Why? Do you think why? Because uh, there are five ministries in China uh, relevant to health policies, right? So they all have very huge conflict interest, uh, and they're competing with their their. Yeah, they're just debating with each other all the time. So I think in really informing uh, from an entire system perspective, a more neutral party that understand those uh, technical details can be the one leading this. So that's why I think really the, the, the Prime Minister Office directly assigned, okay, WHO, World Bank, you are the one leading this. You are coordinating with all the ministries. So that's very, very interesting, especially Ministry of Health. They, they were very, very strong, right? They are the one... Um, uh, sort of managing all the hospitals, and hospitals are very strong. And then the government last year they launched this National Health Security Bureau in charge of healthcare insurance. So sort of trying to build a stronger payer that be able to negotiate and competing with the healthcare system. Uh, but I think one thing I want to highlight is actually last week we did something very I'm very proud because one of the objectives uh, objectives uh, Prime Minister's Office give WHO in this review and also in helping setting the next five-year policy is on digital health. Because everyone, as you, you, you are coming here, knowing that there's a huge booming digital technology in China, but then um, no one knows how formal, in a formal way how they are actually working in a system. Are they really helping improving access? Are they really improve the quality of care? And they, or are they just helping selling more not valuable products to patients right so 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 it need to be more balanced more 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 uh, in, more specifically evaluated and there are many many different kind of business models for digital health uh, Vincent I think later he will describe Piango doctors which is a very direct to C business model so my personal critique to them is they never uh, incorporating with public healthcare system so it's basically a parallel system that they're creating in I think what now their big business model is two things. One is to help selling more insurance products they have, or to sell other sort of lifestyle medical sort of um, drugs or treatments, or to help sponsor companies sell their more drugs. Versus there's some other companies like We Doctor, for instance, you'll be visiting. The, the main business model they have is to help the healthcare system digitization, 
right? So, so there are also a major divide in what the industry can do uh, in digital health, in health data, and others. So I think now uh, what we did is we, together with WHO, held a roundtable last month, uh, bringing uh, 18 digital health unicorn CEOs together in China, together with the head of uh, health uh, in Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent, to getting input uh, from those companies on their, on their paper to the prime minister directly. Unicorns. There are many, yeah. There are more unicorns in China now than the US. Um, yeah, so those are, some of them are unicorns. <laughs> so those are the different categories of um, uh, health tech companies uh, in, the, in the market. Sorry. Yeah, but Baidu is not a health anymore, right? Um, they, they still have a health branch. So, so they're not, um, so they still have some AI components. So, uh, yeah. But they, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, but they so they, they 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 will have a big health uh, department, and then uh, I think they but they still have some <laughs> left. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in case it's been reported that uh, those uh, tech companies brought the lives of patients uh, in danger uh, because of what you're saying, they mm -hmm. they they maybe there's not enough proof mm -hmm. uh, that their uh, treatments are are effective. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, maybe not directly with this story, right? But that's also one of the scandal put uh, Baidu out of health business because uh, people just Google conditions and Baidu lead them to uh, not validated treatment and actually people, uh, some, someone paid a fortune and died. So that actually become a national scandal and now everyone uh, is really looking at the ethics and, all, and the, the, the sort of outcome measurements uh, and uh, into the process. But I think in China, the challenge is it is so big and there's so many organi uh, uh, so many uh, companies that in this, this, this market, right? So it's sort of micromanagement is always gonna be challenging. And then even in public healthcare system, the outcome measurement is just starting. So, so I think it's still a long way to go, but there's, there's certainly... No, 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 uh, government inspection, I think there's, there, oh, there are simple the ones. Yes, they do have. So any pers real prescription or, uh, uh, so there are actual doctors under, uh, in those platforms, but you don't know the quality of those doctors, right? And then, yeah. But I think anyways, so all this I think will be very important and interesting policies uh, that uh, the government uh, will be, uh, will be de uh, designing in the next five years. And I think this also have a global uh, interest because we certainly don't want to kill the whole industry. Right, it's still potentially really sh changing the whole healthcare system, not for China, but also for the, for the world. But really how to, uh, in a more health, uh, managing it uh, so that it's really creating healthy impact to the uh, healthcare systems. I don't think China has figured that out yet. Okay, here are one company I really like, I want to recommend to you. Uh, it's called Possible Health. Um, it's actually founded by a group of Harvard doctors and then it's now the largest public-private partnership program in Nepal. So it's basically a digitized uh, platform, uh, build their own network of primary care workers, uh, directly providing care to millions of people in Nepal, and then funded by the government. So it's, I think, a very good example in technology, high quality standard, and also technology enable local practitioners, and then uh, only serving public health uh, objectives. So I think it's it's a good it's a good example of how health tech uh, uh, enable healthcare system objectives. And there are many other examples uh, in across Asia, like ThinkMD and uh, Allied World Healthcare in the Philippines. ThinkMD is in uh, in uh, India. So and then in China, I think many uh, digital health companies are claim themselves they're they're starting and aiming to do that. Bless you. Uh, any more uh, questions? Okay, so the last one, I think this is also very interesting because, again, a lot of the challenges are driven by misaligned incentive, right? So I think the biggest shift in the healthcare system in China now is the payment. Um, so um, in the past, it's really passive. It's a fee for service in the entire healthcare system. So how much you prescribe, how many procedures you you pro product, uh, you conducted, how many, how much money you receive. It's not uh, really value oriented, right? So this, especially if 
you can imagine if a doctor is money profit seeking, if a doctor is profit seeking, and then it's a fee for service based model, there will be a major problem. So now with the establishment of the National Health Security Bureau, uh, the key of making this shift is uh, become a more strategic purchase, purchasing model in the whole healthcare system. So basically, yeah. So strategic, basically, uh, the payment uh, is carefully designed for healthcare system objective, and then uh, the contracting and the quality and basically, okay, what now people, everyone in China is talking about value-based healthcare. So value is outcome divided by cost. So really starting measuring outcomes and measuring cost and letting the pricing and the payment related to what outcome is and what cost, what actual cost is. Right, and then, I, think, I think in the past, really the, the outcome measures, and then in China it's just uh, very minimum. Sorry. What kind of outcome measures do you mean? Clinical, clinical outcome, uh, patient satisfaction, access, all sorts of. I think from structure to process to, to actual clinical outcomes, uh, it's really just starting uh, building that in China. Yeah. So you mentioned the health security law. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the national health uh, insurance program, basically. Oh. Yeah. It's called uh, Health uh, Health Security Bureau. Yeah. Is there any official procedure to get the patient perspective in uh, innovation? Mm, patient perspective. I think okay. I think uh, in the again, as I mentioned, currently a lot of the digital health companies or in, those health tech companies are having direct to see. Uh, uh, business model, right? I think if that's the case, they certainly at least what patient perceived uh, value they will design for that. But I think the challenge in healthcare as a health economist is always information asymmetry, right? What patient like or they thought is good for them might not be actually good for them. So I think a lot of those um, digital health companies or health, co they take the user interface or user experience into design consideration, but I don't know how much is from the patient outcome perspective. Yeah. You work with patient organization at the local or national level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Policy, yes. I think. Uh, yeah, but I think. Um, how do you say? So the patient organization here in China, there. I think there's. There's less strong. Uh, their influence is less uh, strong uh, comparing to uh, the uh, uh, the physician uh, associations. Yeah. So still in different clinical area, there are major uh, clinical uh, associations which are really setting guidelines and all that. And and I think they're just starting to taking patient voice into those processes. Can, can you yeah. a what kind of outcomes uh, are you referring to and how are you measuring it so that mm -hmm. you can make it payable or yeah. provide it with a financial sure. incentive? Sure. So I think maybe two examples, right? One is paying for drugs, second is pay for service. Uh, for drugs, I think uh, this is actually the next page. Uh, and so uh, basically the use of HTA or health technology assessment uh, is really just starting in China. So bas basically what HTA means to measure the clinical outcome of different drugs comparing to the compar com comparative treatments and then designing the pricing or whether including that drug into the essential, essential drug list by really how much value they provided. Right, so so I think in the help in the and then another thing they are just starting to do is um, so divide so so starting to launching new policies on generic drugs as well. So in the past uh, in China we don't have any efficacy test for all sort of generic drugs with the same chemicals, and now they formally doing that in uh, um, making sure that maybe only those uh, generic drugs passing the same efficacy comparing to original branded. To be able to go into market, and then they compete for price. So I think that's one one good initiative. And the other one is for new drugs, really measuring how much uh, outcome uh, and efficacy they achieved 
in, uh, uh, in providing better uh, clinical outcomes, and then that can help designing the pricing and whether it can be included in, in the drug list. Another, another example is on the service side. So in the past, again, it's people service, right? It's, for instance, you can care for these people, this person have maybe a, a knee replacement, but really you pay can be decided by how much resources or how much treatment you give for that patient. And now China is finally starting moving towards DRG, so diagnostic related groups. So maybe by certain treatments, you receive similar amount and then gradually adding quality measures into that as well. So again, every, from paying drugs to also paying services, uh, the whole system starting to really rigorously measuring uh, outcomes and then tie the payments with outcome. Who's going to measure the outcome? Patient or the doctor? Uh, definitely not patient. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, so another, uh, that's why also the digital health industry is, is starting to be important, more and more important because they are uh, creating the critical uh, resources, uh, which is data uh, that can, and, and, the, analy and uh, the analytics of the data uh, that be able to become the measures. Yeah. Sorry. Um, there's now as many hospitals, private as public, uh, but 85% of all the medical transactions are done in the public hospital. Yeah. And the private ones are much more expensive, right? Sometimes seven times more expensive. Uh, is, is that paid by private health insurance, or how does that work? Or is it yeah. all out of pockets? Uh, so yeah, so we have, uh, I think we have 70% hospitals are private, uh, but, uh, the hosp but, but the public hospitals, they care for 85% uh, of the people. Uh, and not the people, 85% of the, the, the okay. transactions. Uh, so I think there are two types of private uh, health care providers. There are the very poorly regulated ones. Uh, I think that's the majority of the, um, the, the private uh, hospitals, not the United Family uh, Hospital you'll be visiting. Uh, but uh, the, so those are like really good in sales. Uh, they're focusing on specialized diseases and they're doing their own sort of advertisement, attracting people and maybe working with Baidu, <laughs> paying Baidu to do advertisement for tricking people to go to those. So that's actually still the majority of the private hospitals. So in So those, those are not uh, necessarily more expensive. I think that kind, so the low quality private ones. Um, um, but, so, but starting in the last 10 years, maybe there's some sort of high, more, more high, uh, more, more expensive luxury private hospitals being built. Uh, so that's the United Family kind, but that's a very, very small portion, maybe less than 5% of the entire private hospital. Exactly. So, but even for that, uh, I think it's more, certainly, but it's a more people-centered approach, right? But I think for them, more primary care rather than major critical diseases, because well, still... For example, yeah. C-section was 7,000 yeah. euro yeah. in the private hospital and 1,000 in the public hospital. So it's seven times less, but yeah. you have an appointment, you get the time, you don't have 80, you don't, if you have time, you get the yeah. Nice yep. room, nice, nice entrance. Room. No, you, nice get time, you get time attention and, and you don't have to yep. wait in line and all kinds of other yes. uh, Everywhere. But how yeah. do they pay that? Is it's, that insurance it's paid for it? Is it insurance or is it uh, uh, out of pocket? So I think, um, so again, that kind of private hospitals you describe is a very small. It's a very small proportion. It's maybe two percent of the entire private hospital groups, uh, and then I think some of those are paid by uh, private insurance, and yeah, most most of them are by uh, the, the employee, the expat package, or some people paying out of pocket. Yeah. How do Chinese patients look at their doctors? Is their advisor or their decision maker or? Anything I, else? I think they still, yeah, not advise. I think I think they still respect the doctor professionally, uh, if they can see the famous. But in China, we because there's no gatekeeping, right? So most people, they when they have disease, they want to really get to see the expert in that field. Uh, if they see that that expert, they really believe in that one. But uh, maybe that expert can only give you one minute. Um, so they don't question his or her opinion. Mm. Yeah, I think I think uh, the average 
uh, patient uh, sort of consultation time is about five minutes, I think, for that level of experts in China. So you don't really don't have time to to debate or or questioning. Yeah. Uh, okay, but that's also providing the space for digital health, right? Because it's a totally different experience. And then, so I think I don't. I want to skip a few. I think yeah, the last slide. I think really the opportunity is. Uh, it's really uh, for the technology to develop holistic and people-centered service packages, right? So as as we heard, the public healthcare system is very stressed. So that's actually where there are space for uh, technology is to changing the experience for for people uh, receiving care. And then uh, really, uh, I think most of even the government and the most uh, stakeholders in the system are embracing the technology. But then I think the moving forward, the key is really really looking at outcome, look at uh, the value, and then how the technology can potentially really provide value uh, at a uh, strengthening system. Okay. Sorry, are uh, your final questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think the point especially uh, the interval for growing the care and oncology and cancer, how does it work for the acute care? You mean the digital health industry? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I think as far as I know, uh, if, again, digital health companies, they can have different categories, right? Some of them, if they're directly caring for patients, I think they're more targeting chronic disease and others. But many technologies, for instance, they can be able to enable even acute care and enable, uh, for instance, I think you know, um, uh, called Sweet Care or something. Like it's in, in Sweden, they have this uh, company basically help even in the emergency room triage patients, right? So that's how technology really enable emerging care. And then we have one of the, we have actually have a book uh, called EMRI, so Emergency Medical Research Institute. I think that's a very interesting example in India. So it's the largest private pu public-private partnership in India. Uh, major technology uh, innovation in providing uh, ambulance care for seven, 700 million people in India just one call center per state. Um, so I think that's another example. Um, so technology, I think, can still have the role to play even in the emergency care uh, setting. 